Hello and welcome to the new channel. This is going to be, oh, I'm quite excited about this, this is going to be me buying cars with my own money from car auctions, from main dealer, car exchanges, basically anywhere I can get my hands on them. I'm going to be then driving them for a week or so, reviewing them, cleaning them up, getting all the bits done and then flipping them hopefully for a profit. Saying that, today I'm doing something completely different <laughs> already. Um, I've never done a new car before and when someone hands you the keys for a new car it'd be rude not to wouldn't it? So today we're going to be asking the question is buying a brand new Mercedes CLA a good idea? We're going to find out. CLA 200. Should you buy one? I've lived this now for just under two and a half thousand miles, so we, we've had a fair relationship, shall we say. And it produces 161 brake horsepower from, you're going to laugh at this, a 1.3 litre engine. <laughs> what they've done is they've gone back in time. They have taken that successful thing that those boy racer cars did in the 80s and 90s, that the Uno Turbo with its 1.3 and 1.4 litre engine, uh, the Renault 5 Turbo with its 1.4 litre engine, and they just bolted the turbo on the side of it, and that's exactly what they've done with this. It is fantastic. And do you know what? It drives like a boy racer car. It really does. First to fourth gear, it feels like like what it used to. It like relives my youth, if you like. Those things were fantastic, and it, it just puts a smile on your face. It has something that a lot of cars don't. But when you get past fourth gear, you do know you're in a 1.3 because it tends to slug out. But realistically, you're already hitting the speed limit by the time you get there, so it shouldn't it shouldn't really bother anybody. You know, it's not a race car. This is a car where you can take yourself shopping, you can drop the kids off to school, but still have a bit of fun on the way home. This 1.3 litre, they use it in three of the of the CLAs. They use it in the 180, they use it in this, the 200, and they also use it in the hybrid. Now, the 180 is basically a detuned version of this. It's got about 30 horsepower less. Um, but guys who have them, they have no complaints. They say they drive very well, they, the power is fine on them. But in my opinion, if you get out of a 180 and get into one of these, you do notice the difference. It would be really interesting actually to know what a remapped 180 could produce because you're only looking for 30 horsepower which if it's detuned it shouldn't be that hard to find. So is it worth buying a 180 and just remapping it? Time will tell I guess. They also put this in the hybrid as I said and that hybrid is basically the same 1.3 litre engine and they just bought 101 horsepower hybrid electric unit on top. I've not driven that either, but apparently that goes like shit off a shovel. And obviously they're going to do a diesel because Mercedes do a diesel. That diesel, I'm told again, because I've not driven it sadly yet, but I'm told that that diesel pretty much performs like this does. It's just a little bit louder, but it's a lot better on the motorway. So if you do a lot of miles, then you're gonna to wanna to get the diesel because it sits better at 70 mile an hour, if you do 70 mile an hour. And it also gives you a lot more on the fuel economy. Just a better return in general. Now this comes with only one trim option, but, 
why would you want any other trim option? It's the AMG trim option. That's all it comes in at the moment. It probably will come with lesser quality trim. Proper leather seats, not those cheapy flux things. It's got a really, really good sewing system. It's got the heated seats, which is great because it is bloody cold right now here. It is a newer version of the old CLA. There's no getting away from that. They designed it very well, and this is just an up upgrade from that. The 2020-2021 version is what this is. And that was great all by itself. The major difference that I can see in it and the feel in it, well, there's two major differences. One is the dashboard, that display unit. The old one had the analog clocks in front of the driver, and then a digital screen in the center. This has got a full digital screen right the way across. And I like that. It's all touch screen, so I'm in full control of it. Again, all the toys happen on that screen, so you can change the mode, you can change stereo, you can change the map, everything. But you can also touch the screen in front of the driver and it will do various different things. I wouldn't want to replace one though, would you? The other major difference, and it's only a major difference if you drive hard, is the track is slightly wider. I think it's about 65 mil on the front and about 55 on the back. But going into a corner, you can feel it. If you get out of the old one and into this one, you can feel the difference. It looks as good as it always did. Slightly better, maybe. I mean, the ass end on this thing is beautiful anyway. It's sleek, it's round, it's low, it looks grunty, it it just does something that other cars don't. And that follows all the way down to the front end. My only concern with it is it's got that nice modern front end on it, but Mercedes have passed, they seem to age very quickly. And that's probably because they keep changing the front end every well, every three or four days with the look of them. But they do change it quite often, which puts the old one out of date. I've also got this problem where it likes to speak to me all the time when I'm just having a general conversation. I will say, the back end of this is deceptive. That boot is big for the size of the car, but that big boot eats into the rear space. Now, in the back there, I've got the baby seat. My daughter's two, and she's, she's quite tall. But she's got another seat as well. It's a bigger seat. And when she's in the bigger seat in this car, her feet touch the back of my seat. And I don't like that. And she didn't like it either. So I've had to put the Ferrari seat in the back of this car, which fits well. It's just a small, more, more compact seat. So be aware if you've got kids or you've got adults going in the back, because I'm six foot two. So my seat is a reasonable way back. And it doesn't leave a lot of leg, leg room. That boot space really does push into the cabin. But I can get a buggy in the boot lengthways instead of sideways, which is great. I mean, it's great for family, shopping, and all that kind of stuff. It is really, really good. It does drive very well. It's, it is a lot of fun. It's got a good sport mode on it. It's got the eco mode on it, which again, is brilliant. It's got a comfort mode on it. I can't really tell much difference with that in the eco mode, to be honest with you. And all around, it is a good car. It's a good looking car. It feels good. It's nice and comfortable to drive. It is a real pleasure to be in this cockpit. But I do have some issues with it. And they're not little issues. They're not just little niggles. This car has actually tried to kill me twice. I was coming down a dual carriageway on both occasions and I slowed down for a roundabout and as I come to the roundabout there's, there's nothing coming so I drive into the roundabout and I put my foot down and this car is in neutral. I'm getting high revs and the car's going nowhere which is dangerous. If there's a truck coming and you're just trying to get into the traffic that could have been real dangerous. And the only thing I can think of is as I'm slowing down I somehow, with my left hand, these big flappy things here, touch this paddle on the back of the steering wheel. 
and because the car's in first in automatic mode, this panel touching just turns it into manual mode and drops it down a gear. It shouldn't be able to go into neutral when I'm doing 20 mile an hour. It just shouldn't be able to do that. I think what this car misses that a lot of cars have is a distinct way of saying, I want to be in manual mode. Whereas this just goes by you touching the paddle and the paddles are really quite sensitive. And I find myself when I'm coming to rain right now, glancing down and making sure I'm not in neutral. And that kind of takes away from the driving experience for me. Not just that, but the panel box itself, it's a good box, yes it is. But if you get in this car and just start driving by putting it in drive, you're not telling it whether you're in eco, you're in comfort, or you're in sport. So the car will decide for you what you should be in. And nine times out of ten, it gets it wrong. So I can be driving around town with my daughter in the back and my wife in traffic doing five, ten mile an hour, and this thing is revving its bollocks off because it's in sport. I then have to physically go down here and touch the dynamic mode to tell it I want to be in eco, I want to be in comfort. Which is not a good thing. It's, it's a little bit embarrassing because people think you, you, you're like revving the car up or you're trying to race someone in the traffic. And you're really not. Another thing is it looks good on the front end, but if you live anywhere where there's a speed bump higher than an anthill, you're gonna scrape. Honestly, this thing scrapes everything. The bumper itself doesn't actually hit, but there's a little cover underneath, which covers the bottom of the sump, and it scrapes everything. It is so annoying to come to a speed bump and go, I'm gonna scrape this. And again, people walking by look at you because you look like a prat in a brand new car that can't drive it. Now, those are things that you might be able to live with, get used to, but there are two things that are just unforgivable. And the first one is, a, is an old tale. It's depreciation of this car. Now, with this car, if you went into a showroom and gave them £35,000, you'll get a £5 note in change. That's a lot of money for this car. It really, really is. And I get it. If you're a business you can you know claim it against your tax and all that kind of stuff that's fine but for a guy who's saving up his money or retiring or just spending his own hard-earned cash these things depreciate faster than the titanic went down i was at a car auction a trade only auction about 10 days ago and there was a 2016 model cla exactly the same car pretty much just the older version four year old with 47,000 miles on it it had been warranted miles full service history it looked good there was nothing wrong with it you know it might have need the odd touch up in the paint let's say you, say you had to spend let's say you had to spend 500 pounds on getting it perfect again the car sold under the hammer for 14,800 pounds and that exact car, because the receipt was there in the book, was £32,500 new. I don't understand why anybody would go out and spend their own money and lose fifteen grand or more than fifteen grand, which is 50%, right? Or more than 50%. In four years, that's a massive amount to lose. Even if you can live with that, there is something that I bet you can't live with. And I am really struggling. Really, really, really struggling. Not just with that sun. But in the last, let's say, right, I've done two and a half phase miles in this car, so let's just say the last two weeks alone. Right? I can tell you seven occasions when I've returned to this car and the boot has been wide open. 
<laughs> There's nothing wrong with the boot. There's nothing wrong with the mechanism at all. The problem is with the key. The key is shaped, as a lot of keys are these days, to fit in the palm of your hands quite snugly. But I don't know about you, I don't hold my key in the palm of my hand. I put it in my pocket. And the key itself is so sensitive on the buttons. And where the key ring folds over, it touches the button. That if you put it in your pocket and you go in your house and you sit there on your sofa, you will press the button accidentally. I find myself at night checking the back door, checking the front door, making sure all the windows are locked. And then looking out the window, not to check on the car, but to check if the boot is open. And after a bit of time, it's so annoying, it kind of causes you a bit of stress. And a car like this shouldn't be about stress. A car like this should be all about comfort and what it can do for you. But it just doesn't. And it's just something that if I bought one, I would just be so upset that I spent all that money on a car that just opens its boot for anyone. I just don't think I could do it. The other thing about that is I was at my mother's on one of those occasions and my mother lives in a block flat. And it was Christmas and I came out of the block of flats and the boot was wide open and there were presents in the boot. Because you can't tell if the boot's open or not. It's not like, like you walk off, you check it and it shuts so therefore it's going to stay shut. The range on this key is massive. And I don't know why it's so big. I understand, you know, if you need to find your car in a car park, you need to press the button. But it's just too much. And I think in general, this car is kind of a victim of its own advancements. Because it does a lot of things for you. So with, with the gears, it kind of learns your style of drive. So it knows when I'm about to change gear. And then it does it for me which kind of takes away from my driving experience again because I want to change gear, I want the paddle shift, that's why you bought it. It's kind of mocking you. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's got some very good add-ons to it, like if you're in a car park looking for a parking space, this car will find you one. It scans the outside, it tells you, oh, there's a space coming up, it tells you if you're too close to something. It's got the lane assist if you're on the motorway. It's even got auto braking on there. So if something runs out in front of you and you don't react fast enough, the car will. And it will save your ass. Thankfully, I've not used that. And I have no plans on using it either. But a friend of mine's a pilot. And he says that his job sounds very glamorous. But in reality, the plane flies itself. He's just there to make sure that nothing goes wrong. And if something does go wrong, he can get involved and sort it out. And that's kind of what this car feels like. I don't feel like I'm driving it. I feel like it's driving me, and I'm just here to make sure nothing goes wrong. And it does cause problems that make things go wrong. Now, if you've ever bought a brand new car, it's kind of like getting into a new relationship. You know, you go to the showroom, you see it's got a sexy ass from across the room, you go over, you offer to buy it a drink. Next, you know, you're signing a contract and you're taking it home. It's like starting that new relationship and skipping the dating, yet you move straight in together. And that can be nice, you know, new relationships, you get to know each other, you get to learn your faults and your little quirks and things like that. But this car it's like having a really beautiful girlfriend that all your friends love that all your family love people admire her but every night when you go home and you're alone she punches you in the face it's not gonna last too long is it before you get tired so this car to me it's, it's more like a one-night stand 
I'm glad it happened. It was great fun. I appreciate the time I spent with her. Yet, I don't really want it to go any further than that. You know, when my mates ask about it, I will happily show them photos her and show off a little bit. But I wouldn't want to commit to a 35 grand bill to take her home. And the other thing about this car is, two days ago, this car failed what I call my two-year-old test. And what I mean by that is, every day when we go anywhere as a family, or whether I take my daughter somewhere, I let her choose what car we go in. And two days ago, she had the choice of four cars, four very different cars. And since I've had this for over two and a half thousand miles now, she's always picked the Merc every single time. She's always called it her car. She loved it. Two days ago, I said, what car? And she didn't want the Merc anymore. So if this car can wear off on a two-year-old in two and a half thousand miles, imagine what it's going to do to you as a driver. So should you buy one? Well, my opinion is I think we're just going to stay good friends. I don't think I'm going to take her home and keep her. It's just too much. That boot opening is just too much stress that you don't need from a car, from any kind of car. The only thing I can think of is disconnecting the key and the boot, but that's not an easy thing to do. So, I wouldn't buy one. As much as I do enjoy all the other good points of it, the bad points just outweigh it just that little bit much. And do you know what? In years to come, we might be at a friend's wedding and we might bump into each other. And it might be a little bit embarrassing. But, at the end of the day, I'm going to walk away knowing that I don't have to live with her. And that, for me, is good enough. So if you found this video useful at all, please like and subscribe. I've got a good video coming up. It's for a car that in the UK is rarer than a Bugatti Veyron, yet costs less than two and a half thousand pounds. So if you're interested in watching a bit more of my opinion, <laughs> please like, share and subscribe this video. I'll see you next time.